Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. There is a debate going on, and that debate is, is the United States in decline? Everyone in America is discussing this. It's in the cover of our magazines. It's what the pundits are all about on the Sunday shows. I want to start by saying it's an irrelevant question, right? It's not surprising. It's a narcissistic question. Of course, it's all about whether or not we're in decline. That the whole world order depends on whether or not we're in decline. The real point is that the world order has shifted, and it's shifted dramatically. And to explain that in the G0, I should start with what we had before the G0. Because we've had, more or less, different series of G1 pluses since World War II. Right? Coming out of World War II, the United States created its global architecture. The Bretton Woods Accord, the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations Security Council, General Assembly, and the rest. Uh, the, the globalization order, the one that Tom Friedman loves to talk about, is one that was driven by the United States. It was U.S. created and led institutions and architecture fueled by U.S. priorities and values, the U.S. underpinned by the U.S. political and economic system, its capital, its allies. That was the world that we lived in economically, and it's a world that the developed world and lived in strategically since World War II. Over the last 30 years, of course, the underlying balance of power has shifted. It's shifted from the United States towards China. It's shifted from the developed world towards the developing world. It's shifted from debtor economies towards creditor economies. But the architecture stayed the same. In fact, the architecture even became more oriented towards the US when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. Now, if you have a, a US dominated order with its allies, and you have an underlying balance of power that increasingly does not in any way resemble that order, it doesn't take a genius to understand that at some point that's going to break. And the collapse of the Soviet Union was not a big enough shock to make that break. 9 11 was not a big enough shock to make that break. Uh, but the 2008 financial crisis was. And coming out of the 2008 financial crisis, we end up with everyone saying we need a new architecture. Let's create the G20, the world's 20 largest economies, developed and developing in principle, getting together and providing the leadership and public goods that are necessary for us to continue to thrive and prosper. Of course, the reality is the G20 is aspirational, uh, but what we have is a G0. What we have is an absence of global leadership. The reality is we, we will not have um, global responses, either US-led or anyone else. The United States isn't doing it. No one else is going to. We see this as well, whether you're talking about uh, Syria or Iran or climate. The Chinese, the Russian interests are vastly more limited. They're much more focused on their own national security issues in staying in power and ensuring a level of political stability. The BRICs are not cohesive as a group. They have blocking capacity. They are willing to try to stop certain decisions from being taken, but they're not proactively going to create their own agendas, as we've seen now through the IMF and the World Bank. Um, head selection processes. The Europeans are distracted overwhelmingly by the continued Euro crisis. The Japanese 17 prime ministers now in 22 years. That's the world that I think we're in. Um, what are the implications of that? In a US-led global environment, um, you have increasingly global markets, consumer markets, labor markets, capital markets, no question. And if you want to win in that environment, you align yourselves with that US-led process. You want to be a winner. You become a winner of globalization. That's the game. In a G0 environment, risk is much higher. Conflicts 
are not as well addressed. You don't focus as much on growth. You focus much more on growth and resilience together. Winners in this environment are not countries that align themselves to the U.S.-led process. They're countries that are best capable of hedging and adapting to different types of integration, what I call pivot states. Mexico doesn't pivot. Whether you're talking about trade or remittances for Mexicans living abroad or tourism or drugs, it's all the United States, right? A bet on Mexico is a bet on the U.S. Canada. British Columbia, as of last May, started exporting more timber to China than to, to the United States. As we see climate change progress, I can think of a northern shipping route that's going to be very interesting connecting Canada to every part of the world. Canada pivots well. Mexico does not. Look around the world. Turkey pivots incredibly well, especially now that they've jettisoned their relationship with Israel. Between the Europeans and the Middle East, and Eurasia and Russia, they pivot incredibly well. Ukraine would love a customs union with Europe. It will not happen. Ukraine gets to do Russia, and that's it. Ukraine doesn't pivot. Indonesia pivots well. Taiwan doesn't. Vietnam thinks it does. It probably doesn't over time. So increasingly, we need to look at that. The United States is not necessarily a loser in a G0 environment. And there are a couple of interesting reasons for that. 36% of the world's oil goes through the Straits of Hormuz. If the United States decides that it does not want to respond effectively to or ultimately to Iranian threats that say they will shut that strait down, that is a problem for the United States. It is a much bigger problem for China and India, to be clear. This is an environment where uh, the global economy will be run less efficiently. It will be more fragmented. There will be different standards. But if you're looking at resilience and growth together and not just seeking alpha, as they like to say, on the street or in the city, then you do focus much more on the United States. That's the good news. The bad news is the United States will end up with the equivalent of the Dutch disease, right? Well, the Dutch disease, when you have lots of resources, and so as a consequence, you don't worry about political and economic reform. And as a consequence, you don't address the underlying structural deficit issues or even more importantly, the underlying educational issues and infrastructure issues that will allow large number of Americans to continue to feel like the American dream means something for them and their kids and their grandkids. The G0 is not sustainable for long. What comes after the G0? What comes after? Um, I don't think we know yet, but I do think that we can understand a bit of a roadmap. There are two fundamental questions that you need to answer to understand where the world is going to head. The first is, what is the relationship between the United States and the world's second, but soon to be first largest economy, China? Is it going to be relatively cooperative or relatively conflictual? And the second question you need to answer is, how much do other countries matter on a global stage? compared to the US and China. Do they matter a lot? Are they going to be relevant actors in terms of resolution or not resolution of any global conflict? Or are they going to be really marginalized compared to the US and China? If you can answer those two questions, you have a really good sense of where the world is going to go. Let me tell you where I think we are heading. If the G0 was born in 2008 with the financial crisis, we do have you know, a few years, three and a half years so far, to assess what it's been doing so far. Um, First, I would make a strong bet that the U.S. and China are heading in a much more problematic direction. Um, I know that Romney said that the world's, the U America's number one geopolitical foe is Russia. He was only 30 years out of date. Uh, I know that Obama then said that the United States' number one geopolitical foe is Al Qaeda. He's only a few years out of date. Uh, in reality, China is the Voldemort of countries. Uh, it is the country whose name must not be spoken as geopolitical foe of the United States. But it's very clear, if you look at where the U.S. is spending its money, if you look at the purpose of the American pivot towards Asia, it is all about China. So I think so far, if you were going to make a bet, you'd say the U.S. and China are heading towards more conflictual relations. That's number one. Number two, if you were going to make a bet, I would say that other countries are going to matter a lot, not a little. In part, they're going to matter a lot because the willingness of the United States and China to play the role of global policemen or of lender of last resort will, in my view, continue to erode. In China, it will erode because China is a poor country. 
and it will be a poor country when they are the largest economy. And we underestimate how important that change is. A poor country will not view climate the way a rich country does. They will not view global trade the way a rich country does. When we tell the Chinese we want them to be responsible stakeholders, the Chinese response to that is, well, wait a second, you're saying that you want us to act like a rich country when we're not, and you further want us to support a set of standards and rules that you have created to benefit the developed world more than they benefit us. No, we'd rather not do that. The United States has its own issues, which is, if any of you um, have looked at the demographics in the US, you understand the widening gap between rich and poor. And you also understand that so many people in America that don't have university degrees do not have the same level of occupational opportunity. Unemployment for them has spiked through the roof and it's not going down. Well, as the US comes apart, the world comes apart. And I don't say that because everything relies on the United States. I say that because the willingness of the average American to support globalization as something that benefits them will deteriorate. If you believe that other countries matter a lot and the US-China are heading into a more conflictual relationship, then the world that we're moving towards is a world of regions. It's not a world where we have global architecture. But that's not globalizations writ small because different regions will work completely differently. And that's where we will get our challenge, our principal challenge coming out of the G0 world. So that if you look at Europe, Europe compared to other regions of the world actually functions reasonably well as a region. I know that's hard to say and see right now, but the reality is political and economic shared values, more or less, with institutions that are clear and delineated with rule of law that are largely voluntary in terms of your participation. In the Middle East, it's not about Russia driving or Germany driving. It's about three different countries driving. It's Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Turkey. And those three countries have completely different preferred outcomes. The Saudis support Sunni Arab monarchies and militaries, largely the status quo. The Iranians support disenfranchised Shia populations. The Turks support largely urbanized, secular middle classes. So if those are the countries that are going to be the most important for the outcomes across the Middle East, that's not going to integrate the Middle East. That will fragment the Middle East. It will drive the Middle East apart. It will create sectarianism as the principal integrative force in the region. And Asia is particularly interesting, not only because that's where so much of the world's growth will come from, but also because if you are in Asia and you're focused on economics, you are moving closer to China. If you're in Asia and you're focused on security, you're moving more closely towards the United States. That is not sustainable for everyone long term. And so this is not globalizations writ small. This is very different types of integration. This is very different kinds of regions. For the last 50 plus years, we've had a world which really had a single currency that was dominant, a world that increasingly was moving towards more global trade, one system, global standards. I would argue we're now moving most likely towards a system that is much more fragmented. And it's not a disaster. It's not the end of the world. But the winners and losers will be very different. And the efficiencies in this world will be different than the one that we've grown to expect. I'm interested in the degree to which this, this, this what you describe, that, that part of the underlying story here is about the frailties, weaknesses, inadequacies of national democratic political systems. I had a visit the other day from a guy who's running a, um, a project at the Brookings Institute. Yeah. One of the points that he made to argue that this project is not entirely idealistic was he pointed out survey research from, I think, many, many countries in the world which suggested that when people are asked, do they think their nation should keep global rules, keep to global rules, should their nation sometimes put the interests of the world ahead of national interests, that people consistently, two-thirds of populations, consistently say yes. And so it seems as though whilst national politicians are constantly appealing to our worst side, to our nationalism, to our inward-looking, to our selfishness as a sense, people have a kind of deeper well of internationalism. So what do you think going on there? Is it simply that that international expression is pious nonsense and when it's put to the test people revert to their true selves? Or is it that again, there's something about national politics which leads to, which pushes against the internationalism we might need? Uh, I think that, uh, that that survey reflects 
uh, humanity that you can find in any country around the world. Uh, I think it's very easy to say um, that you want to provide, uh, that, that global interests should come in front of national interests. Of course, national politics can subvert that, but I think it's much more fundamental than that. Um, I think when you try to implement, when you try to operationalize that, you get very different senses of what the global mm. interest is. Look, the United States has now got to the point where the average American is willing to say that some money should be spent on climate. They accept that climate change is occurring. It's one of the most easy global issues you could possibly focus on, right? And that's even true in the midst of a recession. They still have that support. How much they're willing to pay for it is a different question. When you ask them to operationalize it in terms of money, it's a very limited amounts, right? What, what are you willing to really give up? But they are. And they're willing to accept standards and all the rest. That, that's, a, that's a plus. Um, but from the American perspective, what that really means is we need to emit less. From the American perspective, that really means we need to exploit less, we need to protect our forests, we need to do these sorts of things. Now, the Chinese perspective, uh, 1.3 billion people, there's an Arctic uh, polar cap that is melting, and there are huge numbers of unexploited resources under that polar cap. Um, very few people live up there. The Chinese perspective is that 1.3 billion represents about 20% of the global population. And therefore, even though they don't have a border that's contiguous, they should have 20% of the resources that's under that. That's a reasonable perspective if you, from a global perspective. The American perspective is a reasonable perspective too. Those are in no means compatible global perspectives, right? I know a lot of reasonable Israelis. I know a lot of reasonable Palestinians. They have mutually incompatible, reasonable perspectives, right? <laughs> um, but you can kill each other quite a bit over reasonable perspectives, right? And so um, I, I, I think we need to be honest about when different peoples at different stages of development with different historic experiences, different experiences on their land, have interests, honest to God interests, that are mutually incompatible. And I think we do a bad job of admitting that to ourselves, right? And th the longer we don't admit that to ourselves, the more we end up with conflict that's intractable because we're both being high-handed. We refuse to talk with each other. 